Hello, everyone. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Strategies to Normalize MIRNA Expression in Serum and Plasma. I'm Christy Jewell of Labberts, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now let's get started. You can submit questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're still fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process of obtaining your credits. We have two speakers for you today. Speaking first is Emily Zeringer, R&D Staff Scientist, Sample Preparation Biosciences, at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Following Emily is Dr. Harita Virschlingham, Senior Product Application Scientist, Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Emily, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much, um, and thank you again to all of our attendees. Very glad to have you here. Um, as mentioned, uh, today we'll be talking about uh, strategies to normalize microRNA expression in serum and plasma. Um, and just briefly, uh, kind of on the agenda today, uh, the first thing we'll cover is uh, why microRNA, uh, why uh, you would want to focus on this as a, a research target. Um, then we'll move on to uh, when working with microRNA, uh, the challenges you kind of face working with it and to being able to normalize its expression analysis. Uh, third, we'll kind of we'll talk about uh, solutions and strategies to address these challenges um, to make um, it's a, make a seamless workflow when working with microRNA. Uh, and then finally, we will move on to a question and answer session um, where we can answer uh, any questions submitted. So please don't be shy. Um, feel free to submit your questions to us. So first, kind of going over, um, excuse me, why you would want to focus on microRNA. Um, first reason um, is actually it's a very well understood regulation pathway. As you can see from the schematic, um, it's very straightforward starting from the uh, prime microRNA, um, processing to pre microRNA, then further into the mature microRNA once you reach the cytoplasm, and then from here, um, the microRNA will actually um, uh, regulate translation of um, message RNA. Um, the interesting thing about microRNA is you can have a single microRNA can regulate multiple messenger RNAs, and then multiple messenger RNAs can be regulated by multiple microRNAs. Um, so a well-understood pathway um, with many points um, in the pathway uh, with potential for study. A couple of other key points which make it a very interesting, it's very well conserved in eukaryotic organisms. And due to all these factors, um, it's very interesting as far as human disease. Um, and actually, there have been documented cases, um, a lot of literature of the part microRNA plays at different points in this uh, pathway uh, in human disease. Um, as I mentioned, um, multiple ways to study in the pathway. Um, the prime microRNA, pre microRNA, and mature microRNA are all targets for both extraction and detection, looking at what is um, upregulated or downregulated, um, diseased versus normal. Uh, in addition, you can also target the ends of the pathway um, and actually measure the messenger RNA expression. Um, seeing if that is upregulated or downregulated, and then trace that back to a particular microRNA or set of microRNAs, um, again, um, looking for an impact um, in human disease and other type of um, research focus. Um, as I mentioned, uh, microRNAs. Um, very good research subject for human disease, uh, one of which is focused on microRNA as biomarkers. 
um, due to kind of their just characteristics, they actually make a very good um, biomarker target um, and then also a target for diagnostic screening because of this. Um, and these characteristics include, um, they're small, they range from about 18 to 22 nucleotides, um, so very few. Um, they are relatively stable in their sample matrix. Um, they do have protective mechanisms, for example, extracellular vesicles or protein complexes that pr protect them from degradation. Um, they are easily assayed, both with sequencing and real-time PCR. Um, as you can see, there are a limited number of sequences. There are about 2,000 total or less um, documented, and all of these um, are easily detected by real-time PCR and sequencing. Uh, the third reason they're actually very useful as biomarkers is they are very present um, in liquid biopsy samples. Um, there's been uh, very much a movement toward liquid biopsy as it's much easier to they are much easier to collect and uh, much less invasive versus the traditional biopsies. And so all of these together um, make microRNA um, a very good candidate for biomarkers and is such a very important area of study. So now kind of moving on, um, we've determined that microRNA, very good uh, biomarker potential, a very good research target and focus. However, they are not without their uh, downsides, um, one of which being uh, challenges to normalization. Uh, microRNAs, just due to their nature and their pathway, they do have a high potential for expression variability. Um, some of these factors uh, you can control, some of them um, can't always be controlled, and so you, there are multiple areas um, where you can address this um, normalization, both with the um, pre-purification, during purification, and then also when you actually look at the data, being able to normalize that. So. The first two, sample type and donor-to-donor -donor variation, not something you can control. That's always variation that's going to be around. You can, however, manage it um, with some of the tips and tricks uh, we'll present to you uh, later in the presentation. Um, but the four I've highlighted here, the collection, handling, the storage, the purification method, and then the quantification and qualification, um, those actually do have a little bit more um, um, things we can do to control them, standardize them, um, to improve consistency and reduce the variation, which leads to much easier normalization. Um, and so um, that leads us to our final section, um, where we will actually go over the solutions and strategies um, to target these four uh, challenges that I've outlined um, above. And so included in solutions and strategies, um, the first is going over tips and tricks for sample handling. Um, these include the actual collection, any pre-processing steps, and the storage of the sample prior to RNA purification. Um, after that, we will focus on the RNA purification and the importance um, of reducing variation, um, improving consistency there. I'll move on from there um, to the ability to use an extraction control as part of RNA purification, one more kind of control built in to reduce variation and improve consistency. Um, and from there, um, I will hand it off to Harita, who will speak to the quantification of microRNA with real-time PCR, and then also ways to normalize um, microRNA expression in the real-time PCR data. So first, we'll go over the sample handling um, tips and tricks, including collection, pre-processing, and storage. Uh, so first, uh, sample handling. Um, a lot of variation we see in microRNA expression can be traced back um, to inconsistent upfront sandal handling, sandal <laughs> sample handling, excuse me. Um, and this includes the initial collection, um, the pre-processing, and these kind of steps can include, for example, if you're um, collecting plasma, the first step is to collect the whole blood and then a centrifugation step, phase separation. Um, and so that's kind of one of the pre-processing steps. Uh, when I talk about that, that's what I mean. And then, of course, storage, um, storing your sample. Um, the biggest uh, issue there, of course, being is the concern of RNA degradation, um, which, of course, will change the expression pattern of your microRNA, um, which is not ideal. 
Um, and so the next few slides will provide some guidance. Um, really the key in um, all of our, our guidance is to um, consistency and standardization. Um, the more standardized your process, the more consistent, um, the that easier it is to compare um, results between for samples collected between different labs, samples analyzed at different times, so you can increase your, your sample size and get a better answer. And so um, that's kind of our focus. So first, moving on to collection. Uh, collection, of course, as you can imagine, does um, it does make a difference what sample type you're focusing on. Uh, collection uh, protocols, for example, for tissue would be a little bit different than for serum and plasma. Um, I've listed, listed them all here. I'm actually, our focus of our talk is much more towards serum and plasma, um, so I will focus towards them. Um, but the same kind of st standardization consistency rules do apply to the other sample types. Um, so when you look at serum and plasma, um, it is important uh, your collection device. For example, serum um, actually is collected in serum-specific tubes. That makes it simple um, in that regard. Um, and then your options are with or without anticoagulants or coactivators. Uh, both of these work very well. Um, the idea, though, is just to, if you collect with one type of tube, keep that consistent over um, the multiple studies um, as much as possible. For plasma, um, again, as I mentioned, plasma is generally first collected as whole blood um, and then processed uh, to separate the plasma from the, the other cell types in the blood. Um, and what we would generally recommend are EDTA, citrate, um, or citrate derivatives as the anticoagulants to use in the tube. Um, we try to, as much as possible, stay away from heparin um, because it can cause a lot of problems for both sequencing and real-time PCR. And so, so EDTA citrate and uh, citrate derivatives um, tend to work much better. Um, so now that you've got your sample collected, um, your nice standardized process for that, um, then of course you move to pre-processing. And as I mentioned before, these include any type of incubations required, mixing steps, phase separation. Um, again, the name of the game is standardization and consistency. Um, when you're talking about pre-processing, again, potential variation comes from, you know, both samples collected at different labs. Each lab might have its own kind of in-house process. And then, of course, between different collections, different processing, you may have variation from that, from, you know, from um, you do it on Monday, you do it again on Wednesday, there could be variation there. And then, of course, variation between sample types, but each sample type will have kind of its own method. So if you're comparing tissue to you know, serum plasma, there's some variation because of the different methods. Um, obviously, this is very challenging, um, you know, when you have collections from multiple labs. Uh, so really, the solution to this, as I said, is standardization and consistency. So we, re we recommend development um, of your own kind of standard process, just to keep everything, you know, everyone uses the same system, you know, reduces the variation quite a bit. Um, you can, also, there are also available existing standard processes, um, and I've listed an example here from the Early Detection Research Network um, for EDTA plasma and serum. Um, so there are uh, multiple ones out there. So whichever method you choose, really, um, to fit your particular um, need, um, you just kind of pick it and then stick with it, and that should help reduce your variation um, and any variation in expression between samples quite a bit and give you confidence that any results you see are real um, and can be and trustworthy. So the final part of sample handling, of course, is sample storage. Um, again, the idea really with sample storage is to present, prevent RNA degradation as much as possible. Um, because again, if your RNA degrades, it can definitely change your expression pattern um, and cause a lot more variation, make it that much more difficult to normalize. Um, again, I've provided uh, suggestions for multiple sample types um, for, um, you know, again, really it's the idea of keeping it cold. Um, keeping it cold prevents degradation in and of itself and also prevents the function of RNAs, which of course will degrade your sample much faster. Um, for whole blood and tissue, frozen, uh, minus 70 or colder um, is ideal. Um, you also have the option of these two for using stabilizers. Um, RNA later is typically one that we use, um, and that gives you more flexibility for both temperature and time uh, to a certain degree. 
Um, unfortunately, um, again, we're focusing on um, biofluids to your own plasma here. Unfortunately, the stabilizers don't work as well for those, um, but luckily for these, you have a little bit more flexibility um, because microRNA in biofluids are often protected by vesicles and protein complexes. Um, you know, again, keep it cold, but you can store it at 4 degrees for a little bit for the day and then minus 20 or minus 80 for longer periods of time um, to prevent degradation. Um, so now that we've covered kind of the sample handling, the upfront part, uh, moving on to RNA purification. Um, and RNA purification, again, um, all of these different parts to working with microRNA, working with samples, um, can have an additive effect on any, you know, variation collected at each different point, and so limiting at each point reduces that overall. Um, so RNA purification, again, if your system you're using is not efficiently um, purifying or extracting the microRNAs, then that, of course, will affect your expression pattern and contribute quite a bit to variation between samples. So again, um, that, is, that is definitely the key point when it comes to RNA purification. Um, there are a lot of kits out there that um, they just, the reagents just aren't optimal for the very small microRNAs, and so it is something to be aware of. Um, other challenges to consider, especially when working with serum and plasma, is uh, you need to have a strong lysostep to re release the microRNA. These would be from their protective, for example, extra vesicle, extracellular vesicles and protein complexes. And this can include organic solvents, mechanical lysis, or enzymatic lysis, for example, with Perenius K. Um, another challenge is um, if you do need DNA-free um, RNA, um, make sure there's some kind of DNA treatment. Um, so you can remove the contaminating DNA if needed. Um, so it's actually, you know, I, there are a lot of uh, methods out there, extraction kits out there, um, which address these pretty well. Um, Organic-based, of course, this is going to be kind of your triazole um, type of workflows. Um, very good for higher volumes and for lower throughput if you just have a few samples. Uh, we also have uh, column-based methods. These will be kind of your glass fiber, glass fiber filter um, column methods. Um, Mervana Paris is one that we use. Um, these are great for kind of mid-volume input um, and then the low to mid-throughput. Um, these can also be combined with the, um, an organic upfront, um, so you'll extract from the aqueous phase. And then finally, we have magnetic bead-based systems. Uh, these tend to use more of the um, enzymatic lysis, um, which is the easiest um, to do for these type of methods, which are focused much more on high throughput. Um, so these are going to be for kind of more screening experiments, where you're looking at a low to mid-volume input, but you're looking at a much higher throughput. So you can screen a larger number of samples um, in order to find um, uh, potential biomarker, and then save the remaining volume of your sample and do more extensive studies later on. So, and I did, this is actually, I did want to highlight um, for liquid samples such as serum and plasma, these type of magnetic bead-based um, workflows or kits work the best. Um, you know, they have the enzymatic, which is very easy for liquid samples, a lot less time and effort required. Um, and here, actually, I've, I've demonstrated the workflow with our MagMax Mervana kit, um, where you take your serum and plasma samples um, using the kit, and it is, it's automation instrument friendly. So with our Kingfisher Flex automation instrument, um, you first do your enzymatic digestion, and then you do your um, purification steps. Uh, the other nice thing about the kit, it includes an, a, a DNA treatment within the extraction method um, instead of having to do it afterwards, so it saves you time. Uh, the other nice thing is once you've extracted your RNA, it um, is easy, you know, it's compatible with all downstream, and so you can take it directly from extraction and put it into a downstream workflow. For example, I've uh, listed here our real-time PCR workflow uh, using our TACMAN Advanced system, uh, but you could also go into a sequencing um, application as well. Um, and so these screening experiments um, are pretty useful. Um, and when you, you know, are looking at the data, you have a couple of options. So um, at the bottom, I've shown some of our data using our open array system. 
um, with the Pac-Man Advance, which Harita actually will explain a little bit more about the, uh, the technology and chemistry behind that um, in her section. Um, but here you can see it's querying, you know, a huge number of microRNAs with several samples, and you are able to, you know, find the targets that might be of interest. And then once you find a few of those, then you can actually kind of pull them out and look at them more closely, larger number of samples um, with a more of a, a single tube or uh, array card type of setup. Um, and here you can see, looking at plasma and serum samples, kind of the CTs you get um, for the different targets. Um, so a whole workflow very effective at um, extracting microRNA and kind of um, preserving that expression pattern um, for multiple different types of analysis. So now that you kind of have your RNA purification method you like, your results look good, um, you know, you, sometimes it's good to double check. And so um, a lot of um, people started kind of looking into extraction controls to monitor recovery. Um, and that's kind of what we've done here. Um, it's, they're a good check to help with normalization, kind of a pre-check step, you know, just to make sure that you really extracted from your sample um, what you plan to. Um, you know, of course, it's difficult to quantify microRNA um, as expression can vary highly. You know, even endogenous, endogenous microRNA, such as MIR-16, um, can fall victim to the kind of the pre-processing variation. And so um, having kind of an external control eliminates the, the any issues um, with that. Um, uh, synthetic microRNA spike in is what we found to be the best. Uh, they need to have some type of modification to prevent uh, degradation. You know, it'll be basically naked RNA being spiked into your serum plasma samples or other samples. So it will not be very protected. Um, from any RNAs, and so these modifications will, will help protect them. Also, they're generally in known concentration, so you know how much you spike in and how much you should get out. Um, uh, we tend to use the Mirvana microRNA mimics, um, but there are other types of synthetic spike ins, and of course, you can make your own. Um, but they fit very well into the um, Workflow, it's pretty much you just combine it with the serum plasma sample and put it through the, um, here I've pictured our Magmax Nirvana extraction workflow. Um, the ones I use are generally non-human. If I'm working with human samples, I prefer to use a non-human spike in, just in case um, I don't want to have any, you know, if I use a human microRNA, just in case that microRNA is expressed in my sample, I don't want that to um, kind of skew my um, extraction control results. And so um, here I'm actually using two C. elegans targets, um, which are pretty well-known targets, um, used a lot in other types of research. Um, but they fit in this workflow quite nicely. Um, so I put it through the workflow and then actually analyzed using both of our microRNA um, analysis, our standard um, microRNA, and then our newer TACMAN advanced workflow. And here you can see two sets of data. Uh, the bottom set focus on first is I wanted to make sure you don't want your, your spike in to have any effect on your actual um, target microRNAs, the, the endogenous microRNAs, or any microRNAs of interest in your sample. And so here, you know, two spike ins for both plasma and serum, multiple donors compared to without a spike um, using the standard chemistry. Um, you can see there's no negative effect. And so my um, that's what I want to see. I want to see the spike ins don't have any effect on an endogenous sample. Um, and then here at the top graph, uh, again, you can see uh, between the multiple donors and the plasma and serum, there's really very little difference in the CT values, which is what you want in a control. Um, so cell lin 4 for plasma and serum uh, worked very well. For um, MIR-39 plasma serum, excuse me, is um, seems to work really well for serum, not so much for plasma. So, um, you know, really the, the control you pick depends on kind of your downstream need, um, but overall they work very well um, and can fit, um, kind of do what they need to do as an extraction control and demonstrate uh, your RNA extraction method works well. Um, I also did the TACMAN Advanced, and again, Harita will kind of explain the difference between the two technologies, um, but very similar results um, for these two. Um, for TACMAN Advanced, we also do recommend some additional modifications, some 5' prime modifications, 
um, to ensure best results with the chemistry. Um, but very much like the standard, um, you can see minimal effect to the um, no spike in control the endogenous targets and um, similar results looking at each one for our, the different sample types. So at this point, um, I will hand it off to Harita to discuss our last two sections around quantification and normalization. All right. Thank you so much, Emily, for that nice overview of sample preparation, collection, and um, uh, use of spiking controls. We will now shift gears and talk a little bit about microRNA detection and strategies for data analysis, including normalization. So we offer um, several solutions for microRNA detection. On the qPCR front, there are two distinct chemistries that are offered uh, by Thermo Fisher. These are uh, the TACMAN microRNA assays and the TACMAN advanced microRNA assays. What you're looking at are um, the pictorial representation of their chemistries, their respective chemistries. And let's look at TACMAN microRNA assays. So TACMAN microRNA assays, the classic microRNA assays, rely on a microRNA specific RT reaction in which a stem loop RT primer is used to reverse transcribe microRNAs. This is followed by um, TACMAN assays to, detection, to, detect, to detect specific microRNAs. TACMAN advanced microRNA assays, on the other hand, rely on what we call as universal cDNA synthesis, in which all microRNAs present in the sample are simultaneously reverse transcribed. This um, process is facilitated by poly A adenylation at the 3' end and adapter ligation at the 5' end of each microRNA. Following reverse transcription, um, all microRNAs present in the sample also undergo universal mirror amplification, and at the end of this stage, you would have all microRNAs um, reverse transcribed and mirror amplified. The next stage of this uh, chemistry is to detect specific microRNAs using TACMAN advanced microRNA assays. Both chemistries complement each other very well and provide solutions for a vast array of applications. TACMAN advanced microRNA assays provide superior sensitivity and are ideal for um, analysis, especially in uh, serum and plasma, difficult to study samples. They can detect as low as 60 input copies of target uh, microRNA. They also come in with a very high specificity, which allows them to distinguish very closely related microRNAs belonging to a single family. Universal um, RT also um, allows you to be able to study them, study a large number of microRNAs with a very small amount of input um, RNA. And of course, they come with uh, the gold standard attachment assay performance. So here's a quick um, overview of the two chemistries and uh, the, the differences. So as I spoke, TACMAN uh, microRNA assays employ microRNA specific RT reaction, whereas the TACMAN advanced microRNA assays employ universal reverse transcription. Each, um, each of the assays um, has been designed for microRNAs in Mirbase, the most recent version, which is version 22, we have over 200, um, we have uh, TACMAN microRNA assays for over 200 different species. For um, the advanced assays, however, are available for human, mouse, and rat. Uh, with respect to throughput, we recommend using the TACMAN microRNA assays uh, for small throughput studies where you're looking for between you know, 1 and 10 different targets. And uh, advanced assays are more suitable for higher throughput, medium to high throughput studies where you're looking at either discovery, validation, or, um, or uh, screening studies. Both uh, chemistries are available in several different formats single tubes, TACMAN array cards, plates, and open array, again, facilitating a wide array of applications. 
the different formats available for both chemistries, as I mentioned, um, chemistries come in different formats. Single tube assays, of course, uh, provide the most flexibility. They are um, ideal for low throughput studies where you're looking at a few samples and a few, num uh, few targets, such as verification. Packman array plates come with pre-spotted assays, which are dried down. They're ideal for small to medium throughput analysis will enable you to study anywhere from 1 to 96 samples on a 96 well um, plate or between 1 to 384 different samples in a 384 well plate. They are ideal for verification and discovery. Saponary cards um, also are pre-spotted with assays. They are ideal for medium throughput analysis. You can investigate as many as 1 to 8 samples per card and the ideal for discovery and profiling. Our highest throughput platform is the open array uh, plates, which are also pre spotted with assays. You can investigate up to 48 different samples, and these are ideal for a profiling, a large profiling study. So you can see um, a very wide range of product um, available to do a lot of different applications. Now moving on to normalizing microRNAs in a reverse transcription uh, quantitative PCR. The purpose of any RT-PCR experiment is to detect and measure biological differences between samples. As part of this um, process, normalization is very important because it reduces or removes technical variability between samples to ensure that the observed differences are only due to biology. There are many different ways that normalization is applied to data analysis. Popular among them are global mean normalization, use of endogenous or reference microRNA, and use of spiking control. The global mean normalization, as we all know, um, is essentially employed when the number of targets that are being studied is large. So anywhere from you know, a couple of hundred to a thousand uh, targets being studied can employ global mean normalization. So applications for global mean normalization would be profiling or discovery. Um, spiking controls have a dual role, as Emily spoke about uh, using them for uh, as extraction and processing control. These can also be used as um, controls for uh, both the uh, both as controls as stand by standalone controls as well as controls to um, help identify endogenous controls which is what i'm going to talk about in a few slides and of course the classic way of uh, normalizing um, gene expression analysis is using reference or endogenous controls and these are controls which are known to uh, be stably expressed across a sample set um, applications for uh, reference controls would be profiling, discovery, and verification. Um, in order to demonstrate some of these normalization techniques, we investigated differential expression of genes in um, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, matched normal and disease plasma samples from donor, donors identified with CLL were obtained and put through the entire workflow, starting with sample preparation, where RNA was extracted using the Magma Nirvana Total RNA Isolation Kit. The, um, RNA was reverse transcribed using the Tacman Advanced MicroRNA CDNA Synthesis Kit, followed by qPCR on the open array human advanced microRNA panel. The open array um, human advanced panel consists of unique 755 microRNA assays and uh, allows you to investigate up to three different, uh, um, three different samples on, on a single array. Uh, these can be run on a Quant Studio 12K flex system and data analysis was done on Thermo Fisher um, Connect using the RQ app. For data analysis, we selected um, 
global normalization in the analysis setting of the RQ app. And what this um, algorithm does is it identifies targets which are common to all samples in the study and identifies um, CQ, me a CQ median of um, all of these targets and uses it as normalization factor for all the samples. And what you end up with is data which is then normalized using global normalization. And here you're looking at a, a heat map of uh, gene expression where normalization has been done using global mean normalization um, across the four different samples that were used in this study. So we had two disease and two normal samples. And you can see that the data is clustered by disease. There was really good um, differentiation of gene expression between um, the disease and normal samples, which is what was expected from the sample set. The next most popular um, strategy to normalize microRNA gene expression is to use endogenous controls or reference genes. However, with microRNA, it is actually pretty difficult or it's a challenging to find endogenous controls or reference genes because it's known that microRNA expression greatly varies between um, tissues, between the different tissues as well as body fluids. Um, and therefore, there is no uniformly expressed microRNA um, which can be used as a candidate reference gene across all tissues. And they are especially more difficult to find in difficult samples such as fusion and plasma. Historically, SNOW RNAs, SNRNAs, and U6 um, have been used as reference endogenous controls. However, more recent um, literature suggests that they're probably not the ideal reference or endogenous controls because um, they follow uh, the uh, mechanism by which the, the biomolecules are synthesized is very different from that of microRNAs. Their size is different, so a lot of these could be degraded um, or you know differentially expressed in uh, disease versus normal tissue. Um, so we we are moving away from that recommendation of using SNOs uh, or SNRNAs as reference controls. Further, um, it is essential to find at least two or three different reference genes that are stably expressed in your set of samples because that is a mighty guideline to, use, um, you know, to normalize data against not just a single but at least a group of microRNAs. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about a methodology to systematically identify a group of stably expressed microRNAs in a given set of samples, which could then be exploited as reference microRNAs. To demonstrate that, um, we uh, use the same set of samples that we have uh, used for uh, uh, global mean normalization. And uh, after RNA extraction uh, from plasma, um, RNA was spiked in with uh, spiked in with a synthetic RNA target, which was uh, a synthetic RNA target for C elegans MIR 39.3p. Um, this mixture of RNA and spike in uh, exogenous control was then reverse transcribed using microRNA assays, which were then uh, loaded on um, or you know in the uh, loaded onto the TACMAN advanced microRNA human endogenous control card. Um, the human endogenous control arrays are available both in, in the card format as well as plate format. And they consist of 30 unique microRNA targets and two, um, uh, so, so it, the 30 unique microRNA targets are human, and then we have two non-human targets on there, C. elegans, MIR 39 3P, and an Arabidopsis uh, uh, target. These 13, uh, 30 microRNAs are known to be um, stably expressed across the different tissues and biofluids, and this information is based out of literature. Um, and we're using that 
to identify reference genes in our set of samples. The CATs are um, run either on Quant Studio system or the VS7 system, and data analysis was again done on Thermo Fisher Connect using the RQ app. And this time around, we used um, the data analysis setting was set to normalization using Python control, which is the second option on um, data analysis. And what did we find? Well, we found that of the 30 microRNAs on the card, there were three that were consistently expressed in um, all the four samples which were part of our study. So these were HSA MER 193A, um, 19A3P, HSA MER 451A, and HSA MER 939-5B. And we identified these as reference genes in our set of samples. So once the reference genes are identified, the next step is to use them as endogenous control in your study, which could be a much larger study. Um, here is a screenshot of the uh, Thermo Fisher um, Connect app with the RQ app showing expression of the three reference genes, right? So uh, you're looking at uh, expression levels of the three reference genes in, in a set of samples, and you can see that they consistently express. The algorithm here also presents scores for each of these um, targets, and a lower score indicates that um, the target is a good reference gene. So once these have been identified, the next step is to use them um, as endogenous controls in your, in your larger study. So for the purpose de demonstration, again, uh, we used uh, the match normal uh, disease plasma samples from uh, donors identified with CLL, and uh, they were put through the same workflow as earlier. And in this case, we, um, for data analysis, we set um, uh, in the RQ app, analysis settings were set to endogenous controls, and the three um, targets that were identified in the previous study were set as endogenous controls. What did we find? So we compared um, differential gene expression between um, the four samples. Um, when they were normalized by global mean normalization and when they were normalized by reference genes. And we found excellent concordance of data between the two strategies, suggesting that both, both these strategies are reliable strategies. Just pay attention, keep in mind that global mean normalization is recommended for targets for high throughput studies when at least a couple of hundred targets are being investigated, whereas reference genes can be used um, for you know any number of targets. There's no restriction. So that's the advantage of using uh, of identifying endogenous or genes. Um, I also wanted to um, bring up that uh, why in this study we had done um, a lot of the analysis and a lot of the experiments on our open array platform. A uh, similar study uh, can be done on both Tacman array cards as well as Tacman array plates. The same number of targets which are present on open array platform are also available on Tacman array cards and plates uh, for investigation. And you will see very comparable data between of the three platforms. This brings me to the end. Um, the key observations from this um, analysis, you'll see that there are many, um, many aspects of uh, microRNA analysis which can have um, a huge impact on uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, differential expression, starting from samples. Um, you know, the met methodologies used for uh, sample collection, sample storage, R RNA extraction, uh, the technology which is used to detect microRNA, uh, the various formats which are used for um, profiling, discovery, and verification, and finally, data normalization, which can be a challenge in microRNA qPCR analysis. Um, however, we provided a lot of tools and a lot of strategies um, 
for you for you to be able to normalize your data um, in difficult samples such as serum and plasma. Um, again, global mean normalization is a good strategy uh, where if in profiling and discovery studies where you're looking at high throughput. And in our um, in our experiments, we found that uh, no matter which strategy you use, as long as the technique to identify reference gene is um, is reliable, then you would get good concordance between the different strategies used to uh, normalize microRNA expression data. With that, it's time to take some questions. Thank you, Emily and Harita, for your presentation. It is time for our live Q&A. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Just click on that Ask a Question box over there on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, our first question. Emily, let's start with you. Emily, what is the recommended sample volume input for the RNA purification? So it is going to depend on um, kind of what method you're using. Um, for example, if you're using an organic extraction, something like the Mervana Paris kit, um, your input's going to be anywhere from 200 to 400 microliters of serum and plasma. Um, however, if you're using more of kind of a screening tool or bead-based, for example, the MagMax uh, Mervana kit, um, your input's going to be uh, 100 to 200 microliters. Thank you, Emily. Harita, let's move over to you. Can I use U6 or other small non-coding RNAs as endogenous controls? All right. So historically, um, a lot of these non-coding RNAs, other than microRNAs, were used to uh, as reference genes to normalize microRNA expression. However, um, the recent, more recent research and suggested have suggested that they're probably not the best candidate endogenous controls because A, they don't um, represent uh, microRNA expression, their biogenesis is very different, their sizes are very different, and also um, a lot of these small non-coding RNAs have been found to be differentially regulated in disease uh, samples, specifically cancer. So while there is data and a lot of publication with um, no RNAs as uh, reference controls, uh, more recent research suggests that they're probably not the best endogenous controls. Thank you, Harita. Emily, back over to you. I like the extraction control idea, but I prefer to use a different miRNA as my control. Is this an option? And if so, what would be your suggestions for confirming it will work with my samples? Okay. Um, yes, you can definitely use, if you have a microRNA um, that you would prefer to use as your control, um, you definitely can. Um, I chose the Elegans. Um, I'd worked with them before, and I um, knew they worked really well. Um, I would caution being careful um, if you are using a human microRNA. Um, as your extraction control, just because um, there's always potential if you're working with human samples, even if, you know, I know some microRNA are for tissue, some are found in specific tissue, some are in serum plasma, some in blood, and not in the other. Um, even if that's the case, um, there is always a chance that they might um, be detected, and so they could kind of throw off your um, extraction control um, values um, in the end. So um, just be... Um, you know, kind of careful of that. And um, what I would suggest, kind of the, the approach I took is um, I actually looked at multiple uh, different targets um, and did kind of a titration of input um, into my sample. I believe I went all the way down to picograms, up to five nanograms to find, um, especially for PCR, you know, you want to make sure that your CT values um, are in a good, you know, range, you know, 15 to 20 is kind of what I look for. Um, and so just kind of titrate, um, you know, kind of what input fits best um, in that range. I would also make sure to use uh, multiple donors um, and also look at both serum and plasma um, because 
those two sample types, although very similar, um, can also be very different. And between different donors, uh, you can also get a lot of variation. Um, and so you want to make sure that your control is unaffected. Kind of like in the presentation, you saw the, the cell lin 4 uh, seroplasma, different donors kind of kept the consistent um, CT value. That's what you'd want to look for. And so you do want to make sure to test um, a large number of samples um, to confirm that before you move on to kind of your, your um, important samples. Thank you, Emily. Now it looks like we have time for one last question. Harita, we'll come back to you. What strategy can be used to normalize miRNAs from exosomes? Um, so exosomes, uh, like serum plasma, uh, we recommend using a lot of the strategies that were uh, discussed in the presentation. If the number of targets that you are looking at is large, so a high throughput study, then ideally uh, global mean normalization is an option. Secondly, uh, just like in serum and plasma, we recommend identifying two or three um, controls or reference genes which are stably expressed in your set of samples, um, and they would work um, as, as uh, reference genes and would be ideal um, endogenous controls for your sample set. Emily and Harita, thank you again. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Yes. Um, well, I would like to say that we, uh, you know, as Emily and I uh, went through the presentation, we have um, workflow solutions for every stage of microRNA analysis. Uh, please take a look at all the products that are offered and um, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions on any of those or any of the material that has been presented today in this webinar. Thank you, Harita. And Emily, both of you, thank you for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webinar. Before we go, I would like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through August 2019. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.